Welcome, you are watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gampi. ISI is plotting an attack on India, Pakistan's notorious spy agency. The Inter Services Intelligence has reportedly tapped a dangerous terrorist to carry out the task. This terrorist is on India's wanted list. His name is Faratullah Ghori. He has released a video calling for a war against India. And for security reasons, we are choosing not to show the video to you. Most of you may be hearing this name for the first time and this is because this person has been underground for a while. So who is Faratullah Ghori? Ghori goes by three other names, Abu Sufyan, Sardar Sahib and Faru. These are his aliases. Ghori is from Hyderabad in India and he is 58 years old. As per reports, Ghori left India in 1994. He first went to Saudi Arabia. And by 2015, Ghori was in Pakistan. Reports say he had joined the Jaish e Mohammed. Ghori has been linked to multiple terror attacks. On the 24th of September, Pakistani terrorists attacked the Akshardham Temple complex in Gandhi Nagar. It was a little past 4:45 p.m. Two Pakistani terrorists opened fire at devotees. The terrorists could not infiltrate the main temple complex, and so they attacked the exhibition halls. Some 30 people were killed. At least 80 others were injured. Gori is also accused of conspiring to eliminate political leaders in Hyderabad in 2004. He is also linked to the 2005 suicide attack on the task force office in Hyderabad. This man is on the run. But in 2019, Gori was found to be active on encrypted chat apps like Telegram. And what was he doing there? brainwashing young people. He was releasing videos and at times he claimed to be reaching out to the youth on behalf of the IS or the Islamic State. At times, Ghori associated himself with the jesh e Muhammad. There were also times Ghori claimed to be preaching on behalf of the Al-Qaeda. But each time, the design and the end goal remained the same. Terror. Through his videos and telegram messages, Ghori was trying to instigate the youth of India, especially the Muslim youths. He was asking them to revolt against India. He was running an online terror recruitment camp. He also had pages on Facebook through which Ghori was peddling an anti-India narrative. Indian agencies shut down these pages. Apart from brainwashing and online recruitment, Ghori has also been financing terrorists. He is giving them money to carry out anti-India activities. In the year 2020, India's Home Ministry designated Ghori an individual terrorist under the UAPA Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. But was Ghori ever working solitarily? He has been working closely with Pakistan's ISI, also the Al-Qaeda and the jaish e Muhammad. In fact, it is believed that Ghori is currently in Pakistan, most probably in Lahore. But his activities are India-centric. In the year 2023, the Delhi police busted an Islamic State-inspired module. The cops found that the module was operated by Ghori. India's National Investigative Agency believes that Ghori was handling IS operations in Delhi, Maharashtra and Kerala while hiding his identity. And now you have the video. Gori is calling for a war against India. Calling on the youth to take up arms against India. He is also threatening the Indian media. The timing is not quite surprising. India is counting down to the Lok Sabha elections. It helps Pakistan's ISI to disrupt the harmony of India 
in the lead up to the world's biggest democratic exercise. But why is the ISI tapping Gori is the question. Because who better? Gori is from India. That way Pakistan gets to distance itself from Gori's activities. He gets plausible deniability. Pakistan can deny that. Gori link lost on anyone. And why stop at Pakistan? You know what? It's not Pakistani soil alone that is being used for anti-India activities. Something similar is happening in the West as well. You heard that right. Recently, some members of the Indian American community held a special meeting. They met with representatives from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Justice and the police. Members of the Indian American community told U.S. authorities that American soil is being used for terror activities against India. They highlighted how hate crimes against Indian Americans are on the rise. How there are constant attacks on Hindu places of worship. The authorities were told that over 11 temples in America's Bay Area alone have been vanished. either to make Indian Americans feel safer or to stop anti-India activities on American soil. Indian Americans were angry that the American authorities have failed to take action against those who tried to burn the Indian consulate in San Francisco or against those who are threatening Indian diplomats or openly calling for terror attacks on India. This meeting happened in the Silicon Valley what was the response from the American authorities, you ask? Some of the community members who attended the meeting said the American officials claimed they were not aware of the Khalistani movement in the U.S. Why don't I repeat that for you? The American officials said they were unaware of the Khalistani movement in the U.S. How do you believe that? Khalistan supporters have been openly holding protests in America. Khalistani terrorists like Gurpatan Singh Panu have been openly, openly threatening to attack India from America. And American officials say they don't know what's happening. Panu, by the way, holds American citizenship. He stays in New York. Surely the American authorities have seen the kind of videos that this terrorist has been publishing. It was baffling as it is that American authorities have taken no action against Panno, that they are allowing anti-Indian activities on their land. And now this new claim of being unaware of the Khalistani movement in the U.S. is a new law. During this meeting, the Indian American community named Panno. They named Sikhs for justice drew the link between SFJ members and the targeting of Hindu temples, the American authorities promised to do more to ensure the safety of Indian Americans. And we hope they are serious about this. Speaking of threats to India, a recent development in India has greatly angered China. And why is the dragon breathing fire, you ask? It's because the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited India's northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh to inaugurate a strategically important road tunnel. Now, why would China have a problem with what's happening within India? Well, it has to do with China's habit of making false historically inaccurate, frankly absurd claims on territories that are not its own. It is a fact that Arunachal Pradesh is an Indian state, but you see China refuses to accept this truth. 
Beijing parrots the same line again and again each time an Indian leader visits the state, drawing a fiercer and unequivocal response from India. What China really has a problem with is this. What you are seeing on your screen is the Sela Tunnel located in West Kameng district of Arunachal Pradesh. The Sela Tunnel cuts through the Sela Charbela Ridge. Strategic infrastructure that will ensure all weather connectivity between Guwahati in Assam and Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh. And I call it strategic because it will play a key role in the year-round movement of Indian Army troops. The tunnel will help with swift deployment and maintaining operational readiness along the border. Not only will it provide all weather connectivity, the tunnel will also cut down the travel time to Tawang by at least one hour. That means faster deployment of weapons, soldiers and equipment to the forward areas near the line of actual control. And this is why I say that the new Sela tunnel gives an edge to the Indian army against China. You see Arunachal Pradesh, which borders Tibet to the north, Bhutan to the west, Myanmar to the east, is like a protective shield to northeast India. China claims Arunachal is part of South Tibet, but really China has its eyes on the district of Tawang. And experts say it is for tactical reasons. Tawang is located in the northwestern region of the state at a critical point in the corridor between Tibet and India's Brahmaputra Valley. It provides a strategic entry into India's northeastern region. And historically speaking, Tawang, which is located just a few miles away from the border, was at the center of China's assault on India in the 1962 Indochina War. The People's Liberation Army had seized Tawang in a surprise attack and had remained there for around a month before withdrawing. Sixty years later, tensions escalated once again when Indian and Chinese troops clashed along the Tawang border. Tawang is also the site of the largest Buddhist monastery in India and a crucial military site. It is from Tawang that the Dalai Lama escaped the Chinese assault and crossed into Indian territory. So, Tawang has a strategic and historical importance for India. Given China's territorial claims over Tawang, India remains vigilant, fortifying its military presence and infrastructure to safeguard its sovereignty. The Sela Tunnel aids that process. India's infrastructure push along its farthest frontiers has been described as a firm and focused response to China. It is a deterrence against China, with whom India has been locked in a standoff in eastern Ladakh since May 2020. Sure, things are quieter along the LAC in the east, but the army's operational readiness is at its highest level. That's the promise of the Sela Tunnel. And what's more, the new tunnel will not only boost India's defence preparedness, it will also give a fillip to the region's socio-economic development. The civilian population will greatly benefit from a more secure and faster transportation route. It will grant people easier access to markets, healthcare facilities, educational institutions and other indispensable amenities. And apart from the Sela Tunnel, India is also constructing a 1,700-kilometer-long frontier highway. This will connect all the frontier districts and sites along the entire breadth of Arunachal Pradesh. It will greatly aid the Indian Army move troops easily from one position to another. And that's not all. The Trans-Arunachal Highway will add a similar boost. With the completion of these infrastructure projects, the army will soon be in a position to match the Chinese in terms of infrastructure. It will nullify China's advantage of easy accessibility to the border positions and give India a strategic edge over China. Did the United States engage in secret talks with its arch nemesis, Iran? Was the US seeking Iran's help in stopping the Red Sea attacks? 
An explosive report by the Financial Times reveals that Washington tried to hold talks with Tehran earlier this year. The report suggests that the U.S. was trying to persuade Iran to use its influence over the Yemeni Houthis to halt the attacks on ships in the Red Sea. And if true, this would further indicate the failure of Operation Guardian Prosperity. It would signify an admission that the U.S.-led naval task force, which was aimed at stopping the Houthi attacks, failed in preventing the disruption of international shipping. Now, here's what the report states. The indirect negotiations, during which the U.S. also raised concerns about Iran's expanding nuclear program, reportedly took place in Oman in January. The U.S. delegation was led by the White House's West Asia advisor, Brett Megurk, and its Iran envoy, Abram Peli. The Iranian side, meanwhile, was represented by Deputy Foreign Minister Ali Bagheri Kani, who is also Tehran's top nuclear negotiator. And I said indirect negotiations because they were, in, they were mediated by Omani officials. Omani officials reportedly shuttled between the Iranian and American representatives. So they did, they did not really speak directly. According to the report, a round of talks scheduled for February was delayed as McGurk redirected his focus on efforts to secure a temporary truce between Israel and Hamas, as well as secure a hostage release deal. The talks underline how the Biden administration is using diplomatic channels with its enemy, even as it uses military deterrence, all in a bid to de-escalate a wave of regional hostilities that would involve Iran-backed militant groups. Now, according to the report, U.S. officials see an indirect channel with Iran as a way of talking about the full range of threats that the U.S. says emanate from Iran. And this includes, as per the report, the U.S. conveying to Iran what it needs to do in order to prevent a wider conflict. Remember, Iran itself has said that it is not looking for war. The last known talks between the U.S. and Iran were the so-called proximity talks last May. And then as well, by the way, the Biden administration had quietly restarted talks with Iran in a bid to win the release of American prisoners held by Tehran and curb the country's growing nuclear program. Since Hamas's October 7 attack on Israel triggered the war, Iran-backed Lebanese militant movement Hezbollah has traded daily cross-border fire with Israel. Pro-Iran Iraqi militias have launched scores of missiles and drones against American forces in Iraq and Syria. And the Yemen-based Houthis have attacked dozens of ships. They say they are acting in solidarity with the Palestinians who have come under Israeli assault in Gaza. Their Red Sea attacks have disrupted global shipping, forcing shipping firms to reroute and undertake a much longer and more expensive journey. U.S. officials have repeatedly accused Tehran of supplying Houthis with weapons and intelligence to conduct these attacks. But you see, Tehran has denied being involved in Houthi attacks. While Iran has acknowledged its political support for the Houthis going so far as justifying their attacks as support for Palestinians, it insists that the Yemen-based group acts independently. U.S. officials reportedly know that military action alone will not be enough to deter the Houthis. Washington reportedly believes that ultimately Iran will need to pressure the Houthis into stopping the activities. You see, the relationship between the Houthis and Iran has reportedly deepened, with the Yemeni group becoming an increasingly important member of Iran's so-called axis of resistance. Naturally, Western powers led by the U.S. are worried. As I mentioned, they are already concerned about Iran's nuclear program. They say Tehran has continued to enrich uranium at levels close to weapons grade. In fact, before the Gaza war started, Iran's nuclear program was the focus of the Biden administration. Washington was trying to contain a crisis triggered by former President Donald Trump's unilateral withdrawal from the 2015 nuclear deal that Iran had signed with world powers. And then in September last year, Tehran and Washington agreed to a prisoner swap. After that, Washington also unfroze 
six billion dollars of Iran's oil money, which had been stuck in South Korea. The funds were transferred to an account in Qatar, where the use would be better monitored. And alongside that deal, the U.S. was also seeking to agree unwritten de-escalation measures with Tehran, including a cap on its uranium enrichment. But all that changed when the Gaza war broke out. Not only did the war dash all hopes of progress in ties, Iran has also not been able to access the $6 billion transferred to Qatar. To be sure, the U.S. did not freeze the funds, but the process of identifying which foreign companies are clear to trade humanitarian goods with Iran using that money has stalled. And naturally, Iran is frustrated. Already, it is facing mounting economic pressures as it stands isolated due to sanctions by the West. So as the situation stands today, the revelation that U.S. held talks with Iran gained significance after the report of their secret talks came out. Iran's state news agency quoted an informed source as saying that the discussions were limited to the lifting of American sanctions on Iran. But what was really discussed between the Americans and the Iranians? I guess we'll never know. Meanwhile, Iran's Minister of Defense, Mohammad Reza Ashtiani, was quoted as saying, Iran has increased arms exports four to five times in the past two years. Ashtiani said, and I'm quoting, certainly in the future, these exports will increase even more considering the innovations being made and the new armaments we are pursuing and unveiling. It is the 14th of March. In hours from now, that is on the 15th of March, the Indian payment application Paytm will have to shut down some of its services. What exactly is going to change and how is it going to affect you? You may have a lot of questions. Let's break it all down for you. First of all, a quick reminder here. Why is this happening in the first place? What led to these changes? Well, the fintech firm landed in a soup due to rule violations. Reports say that thousands of Paytm payment bank accounts were opened without proper identification. And this has led to concerns of potential involvement in illegal activities such as money laundering. Multiple accounts were found to be linked to the same identification proof and their transactions added up to significant amounts. There was also an unusually high number of dormant accounts. Due to all this and more, the RBI slapped restrictions on PTM. And starting tomorrow, that is the 15th of March, the PTM Payments Bank will shut down. It's supposed to be a temporary move. The bank will be investigated by the Enforcement Directorate. Coming to what's going to change for you, customers will not be able to deposit money into their Paytm payments bank accounts. But they will still be able to withdraw or transfer funds. Salary credit, direct benefit transfers or subsidies will not be available, but refunds, cashbacks, sweep-ins from partner banks will continue as usual. Basically, if you are someone who actively relies on Paytm payments bank accounts, you will not be able to carry out your everyday transactions unless you link another bank account to your Paytm. And another major aspect, this is regarding the Paytm wallet. You will be able to use the money already deposited in it, but you will not be able to add more funds. And then there is fast tag. For those unversed, a fast tag is used for swiftly paying tax at toll plazas. The tag is attached to the windscreen of the vehicle and is linked to your bank account. The scanners at the toll plaza identify it and deduct the money directly from the linked account or prepaid card. But unfortunately, for Paytm payment bank account holders, the fast tag will also stop working. They will no longer be able to recharge their balance. 
The National Highways Authority of India has excluded Paytm Payments Bank from its list of approved Fastag providers. Fastag accounts cannot be transferred between banks. So if you have one, you can consider closing your account and requesting for a refund. And if you want to continue using Fastag, then you can get a new one from the 32 banks currently authorized by the NHAI. So the question is, should you be worried? If you are someone who uses a Paytm payments bank account, wallet or fast tag regularly, then yes. So what other options will you have as a user? Paytm says that it will transfer all Paytm payments bank accounts to other banks. And how long will that take? How seamless would that process be? We don't know. The RBI says it had warned the platform well in advance. In March 2022, it had asked the Paytm Payments Bank to stop adding new customers. But according to audit reports, Paytm did not pay heed to the warnings. There were persistent non-compliance and supervisory concerns. And two years on, the Paytm Payments Bank is facing the consequences. How badly is it affected? Well, in the 10 days following the RBI's announcement, Paytm stock lost more than half of its value. This amounted to a market capitalization loss of 26,000 crores. That is over $3 billion. Paytm employees are going to bear the brunt of this. Its losses are expected to lead to layoffs. What comes next? Will Paytm survive this nightmare? Its users are for sure having a tough time. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak just cannot stop making headlines for the wrong reasons. Sunak is now in the news for an archaic law, one that allows his wife Akshita Murthy evade inheritance tax in the UK. Our next report getting you all the details. Let's face it, Rishi Sunak is not quite popular as British Prime Minister. Sunak's incredible wealth does not help his case, especially at a time when the United Kingdom has entered recession, when Britons are struggling to make their ends meet and cope with joblessness. But here you have Rishi Sunak, back in the news, and once again, it's a money matter. A loophole in the British law will help Rishi Sunak's wife, Akshata Murthy, save millions of dollars inheritance tax, as the name clearly suggests, is the tax you pay on the estate you inherit. Britain charges a 40% inheritance tax on any estate that is valued at more than £325,000. That's nearly $415,000. Now, Akshata Murthy clearly stands to inherit a lot more than that. She is, after all, the daughter of Indian tech billionaire and Infosys co-founder Narayan Murthy. But here's the thing, Akshata Murthy will not have to pay inheritance tax. Why? The answer lies in the 1956 estate duty treaty. It allows Indian citizens living in Britain to avoid paying inheritance tax, meaning it allows Akshita Murthy to only pay her inheritance tax in India. But guess what? India scrapped inheritance tax in 1985. India does not require Indians living in the UK to pay tax on the inheritance they receive, meaning Akshita Murthy won't have to pay her inheritance tax in India or in the UK. The Britons aren't happy about it. Which struggling economy likes the thought of the rich getting richer? Earlier this month, the British government axed the non-dom status. You see, all this while, UK residents who are domiciled abroad had to only pay levies on their earnings in Britain. For years, Akshita Murthy too claimed non-domicile status, which means she did not have to pay tax in Britain for the money she makes outside the country, at least for some time. In 2020, Rishi Sunak became the British Chancellor there was scrutiny over Murthy's taxes. Murthy, reports alleged, had potentially avoided paying £20 million or over $25 million in taxes. The controversy nudged Murthy to voluntarily start paying taxes on foreign income. In 2022, Sunak became the Prime Minister. A section of the British society expressed discomfort in the non-domicile status of Akshata Murthy. 
who was now the wife of Britain's richest Prime Minister. And now you have the inheritance tax controversy. Some experts believe that the reason the UK never changed the law with regard to the estate duty treaty despite India scrapping it is because so far there was no interest. Now that clearly changes with the Akshata Murthy case. The updates should be interesting. Bureau Report, we on, World is One. How much do you think top bosses of big corporate firms earn? You know, the CEOs, the COOs, the CFOs. They get big paychecks, but just how big are we talking? You will be surprised to know. In big American companies, the senior executives earn more than their companies pay in taxes. I'm talking about the likes of Tesla, Netflix, Ford and 32 more firms. What are the numbers looking like? From 2018 to 2022, Tesla paid $2.5 billion to its executives, but it paid only $1 million in federal taxes during the same period. The top brown And these are all very profitable companies that we are talking about. From 2018 to 2022, Tesla made $4.4 billion. T-Mobile US made $17.9 billion. Netflix, $15.1 billion. This is according to an analysis by Americans for Tax Fairness and the Institute for Policy Studies. Basically, the analysts found that the collective federal income tax bill of all 35 companies was negative $1.72 billion over the five-year stretch. Now, how was it negative? Well, because these firms collectively received more money back from the government in refunds than they paid in taxes. Aren't these big firms hoarding enough wealth already? Now they are saving on taxes as well. There are multiple tax breaks and loopholes. in 2014. This is according to a 2022 analysis by the Government Accountability Office. Big firms are underpaying taxes and overpaying executives. You know who is ultimately suffering because of all of this? The middle class, the working families. They get smaller paychecks and diminished public services. Now, the advocacy groups are calling to reverse that. They have urged the Congress to increase the corporate tax rate. They claim that raising it just by 7%, that is from 21% to 28%, would generate $1.3 trillion in revenue over a decade. And President Joe Biden seems open to the idea, by the way. During his State of the Union address, he declared that it was time for big businesses to finally pay their fair share. He pledged to end the tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private jets and massive executive pay. Biden has proposed higher taxes on individuals whose net worth exceeds $100 million. But not everyone is on board with the president's plan. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has criticized it wholeheartedly. Just for context here, it's a massive pro-business lobbying group. Reports say in 2023, it spent nearly $70 million on federal lobbying. And apart from that, there are the Republicans. It's highly unlikely that President Biden's proposal would pass the Republican-controlled House. 
But in any case, federal taxes are expected to remain a hot topic in the upcoming elections. That's because many provisions in the 2017 tax law are set to expire in 2025. Shifting focus now to India, a lot is happening and it's bound to make the upcoming general election very, very interesting. Just now, in a big move towards transparency in political funding, the Election Commission of India has uploaded the data of electoral bonds. This data has to do with the purchases of bonds of denominations uh, between 1 lakh and 1 crore rupees. Dating back to April 12, 2019, and reveals purchases by companies as well as individuals. Now, this data has come from the State Bank of India. The National Bank submitted this data to the poll panel on Thursday, a day before the deadline set by India's Supreme Court. You see, this data comes after India's top court on Monday told the government-run State Bank of India to make public names of individuals and companies who have donated billions of rupees to political parties through the electoral bond scheme. A seven-year-old scheme that the court scrapped on the 15th of February. And that was accused of being an opaque funding system. The electoral bond scheme allowed unlimited and anonymous donations to political parties. The Supreme Court scrapped it after finding it unconstitutional. And another big development that could change the way the elections are held in one of the most diverse countries of the world an Indian government-appointed panel has recommended India hold elections to state assemblies and the national parliament at the same time. Essentially, the panel has recommended what is being termed in India as one nation, one poll. The panel says that the process of holding simultaneous polls would not only increase transparency and inclusivity, it would also improve governance and growth. The panel, which was appointed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government in September, submitted its report to President Draupadi Murmu today, just days before the date is announced for the upcoming national elections. Now here it's important to note this report will not affect the upcoming elections. First, a one nation, one election law will have to be passed by the parliament and then it will have to be ratified by all the Indian states. That could be a challenge. Because you see, some states are ruled by Prime Minister Modi's rivals and they have opposed the idea of one nation, one election. The opposition says that holding polls simultaneously violates India's federal politics. Out of the 47 political parties in India which gave their opinion to the panel, 15 parties opposed the idea of simultaneous elections. One of them is the Indian National Congress, also referred to as the Grand Old Party of India. And today, the Grand Old Party of India is allegedly running out of money. On Wednesday, the Congress president, Malikarjan Kharge, indicated that the party is facing a funds crunch. He said that the bank accounts where money donated by people had been kept He alleged. Targeting the Modi-led uh, BJP, Kharge said that everyone should have equal opportunity in an election. He said, and I'm quoting, they are not ready to disclose thousands of crores of rupees that they have got through electoral bonds despite the Supreme Court's directions. And not stopping there, Kharge alleged that the donation made by uh, the supporters to the Congress uh, were frozen while the BJP has not even disclosed details about the electoral bonds that they got because their quote-unquote theft will come out. Clearly, even though the Supreme Court has scrapped it, the electoral bond scheme remains a contentious issue. Will it have an impact on the elections though? We will of course get a clearer picture once the details come out.